Uh, hello. Um, yes, my name is Eric Fatland. I know it's funny in English. Uh, when I was 16 years old, I went along with a bunch of friends uh, into the forest to play. Uh, and now it's more than 20 years later and I have absolutely no intention of stopping. I'm here to talk about the history of live role playing and how uh, we and the curriculum at this summer school fits into all of it. But first, our KVAT. I A N A H. Iana. I am not a historian. Um, I'm aware of that you need to be critical of your sources and stuff like that. 99% of LARPers are not historians, so when we look at the kind of the origins of LARP, we find a lot of really outrageous claims, which I will not. Uh, there was no 500-person uh, mega LARP in, uh, in Sweden in the early 70s, for example. What is LARP anyway? I mean, now you've had, some of you have been, been to LARP before. Some of you have had your first taste now with the family Anderson. Uh, the name LARP, which sounds a bit like LARD, not a very good name, but it's a name we have. It comes from English live action role playing. And LARP basically works like this. If I pretend that I'm someone else, and if you pretend that you are someone else, and we help each other pretend, then we're role playing. So if I go around and say, I am Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of France, then I might be crazy or I might be acting, but I'm not really role playing. But if you answer, yes, Napoleon, then suddenly we are role playing. Like these two people. The uh, guy to the right is a street urchin, uh, damaged physically and mentally, and one day he, he sees a woman who he calls an angel and manages to persuade her to come for a date, sitting in these very romantic toilet seats. Yeah. And they're role-playing. This is a picture from actual play. Now, we often say about LARP that it is like improvised theatre without the audience. But that's kind of a bit besides the point, because that scene you just saw, the toilet seats and the date that happens, was around here. And this here is the center of Oslo. Uh, it's a major square, and from the balcony where this picture was taken, there were hundreds of people standing lo looking down. So there was an audience, but they didn't care. They were not doing it for the audience. They didn't care if the audience could see them or not. They were in their own world, in their own mind, uh, doing it for their own purposes. And that's what makes it role-playing. There are two old definitions. I'm sure there are more precise definitions by now, but these have followed our community for a while. The Manifest of the Turku School uh, says that role-playing is immersion uh, to an outside consciousness and interacting with its surroundings. So immersion is that mentally, that, that fin, word, Finnish word, eleity meaning, and we have actual Finns here, so I might mispronounce it, but it means putting yourself in the shoes of the character. And that's a mental process. And on the other hand, we have um, a competing manifesto, Dogma 99, that says, LARP is a meeting between players who, through their characters, relate to each other in a fictional world. So here it's all, it's all in your head, it's what's happening in your head that really matters. And here it's all in the interaction, what's happening between us that really matters. And if you look at LARP very closely, at role-playing very closely, you'll find that, you know, both the interaction and what's going on in your head do play a role in role-playing. This map I update every year. Uh, the um, pinkish-purplish areas are places where we have reason to believe that there is at least one LARP held every year, and often many more. I mean, count German LARP, for example, and it will be several hundred. Or Danish LARP, where also several hundred individual events every, held every year. And then there are some other places where there are rumours. Um, like, we have he I, I have heard reports that there might be LARP some places in China, but I haven't found verification of it. Uh, Tanzania is coloured here because we know there was a LARP held in Tanzania just a month ago. We don't know if there will be one next year, if there will be any kind of continuity. Uh, and ev every year this map goes pink, grows pinker and pinker, like more, or more of the world. We either find uh, LARP communities that we hadn't heard about before, or new communities start up. So where does all of this stuff come from? Because it wasn't here 20 years ago. Uh, go at least, well, 30 years ago this would be white. Nobody did anything that they called LARP. Um, 
So where does it come from? Well, there are writers who have tried to address this topic. One guy, Martin Eriksson, um, Swedish law writes, uh, he looks back to some of the same sources that uh, historians of theatre look at when they try to track the history of theatre. And one of the earliest recordings of a performance uh, is from ancient Egypt, describing a grand spectacle on the River Nile, documented by the treasurer to the pharaoh, uh, who was um, apparently quite into this stuff, because he, he keeps saying stuff like, uh, I made the boat sail, and I made the priest perform the rituals correctly. But it's all in the I form. It's all talking from his own point of view, which, from our point of view, might make it more like role-playing. Mikke Pojala, a Finnish designer and theorist, uh, looks at the origins of the Greek theatre, another popular source for theatre historians, uh, and finds in the proto-theatre, the early rites uh, and rituals and celebrations that became the Greek theatre as we know it, also similarities with, with uh, LARP. Lizzie Stark, an American non-fiction author, uh, has looked at pageantry uh, in European courts in the 1600s and claims, with some justification, that Queen Elizabeth was a LARPer. How can we know? That's the thing with LARP. It happens here and now, between us in this moment. We can take pictures of it, we can film it, but it is not the same as the actual experience of the LARP. As I said earlier, the way we experience it matters a great deal. Uh, none of these examples called their activity role-playing. And there are other more recent examples of like a group of friends uh, who went to a villa uh, somewhere in the French countryside, or I found some Norwegians who went to a cottage in the 1930s and did something that sounds to us a lot like role-playing, but they didn't call it role-playing. And since they didn't call it role-playing, and since we have no reason to believe that they looked to the past, Queen Elizabeth probably didn't look at ancient Egypt uh, when participating in court spectacles. Um, it's hard to say that our history begins there. It's more that we can say that, okay, we are doing this. And this is a bit like that. That's interesting. We can learn from that. But it's not our history. So to try to string this together into something re resembling a coherent history, I've tried to follow the most important word, in the acronym, role-playing. And role-playing, it turns out, has a history. And the history of role-playing has a beginning time and a beginning place. The place is certain, the time not so much, but uh, we are in Augarten, in Vienna, in uh, roughly 1910. This is a public park, uh, part of the Imperial Gardens, I believe, in Vienna. And in the 1910s, people who frequented Augarten started telling of uh, a weird black-haired young man who would hang out in the garden. He would watch the children playing, because this was a popular place for children to go and play. Uh, he would observe them, he would tell stories to them. Uh, he would sometimes climb up into one of those trees and hang from branches telling stories to the children. So the kids, of course, they loved this guy. Uh, he observed their play and he started um, giving them instructions, uh, telling them, what if you play in this way or that way? Eventually, this uh, morphed into spontaneous theatre performances and so on. Eventually, also, when the kids began uh, refusing to go to the activities their parents had decided to send them to, um, because I would much rather go to the uh, park and play with a mysterious man with a foreign accent, uh, this young man started feeling a bit nervous about the whole endeavour, and he pulled back. His name was Jacob Levi Morino. Uh, and he is the father of role-playing in the sense that he was the first to talk about role-playing at Spiel, I think it was in German. Uh, and he credits these experiences in Augarten Park in Vienna, um, observing children play, tampering with their play, structuring it. He credits them as the beginning of his exploration of what he calls spontaneity uh, and of roles. Marino has a position in the history of psychology. Uh, he was uh, studying to become a doctor and then became um, a psychiatrist. So he's a contemporary, a bit late contemporary, a young man at the time when Freud and Jung and so on were middle-aged or old, but part of that same scene of early psychology. Uh, he's also credited with, with it being one of the early sociologists. Um, and as far as I've been able to figure out, Marino is the reason that sociologists talk about the concept of role as well, social role. Uh, we'll hear more about that later. 
Um, but in the early parts of his career, he was uh, obsessed with this idea of spontaneity. What happens when we structure play? What happens when we invite adults to play? One of his earliest explorations of this in a more uh, formal context was uh, the theatre of spontaneity. It was a physical theatre building, like you could go and visit uh, the theatre of spontaneity, where they put on living newspapers. That is, they took the newspaper of today uh, and made dramatizations of the, of the news and invited the audience to come up on stage and uh, to take part in the performance. There was an Italian LARP designer, Andrea Castellani, who a couple of years ago dug up all the old notes on the living newspapers uh, and, uh, and rec tried to recreate it at a role-playing conference. And people generally recognized that, yes, this is, this is LARP-like, we recognize this. This makes sense to us. As the director of the Theatre of Spontaneity, Moreno was a bit of an anti-establishment figure. Um, he claimed to have interrupted performances at regular theatres. Uh, we don't know if that actually happens because the only guy who writes about this is Moreno. Uh, but jumping up on stage and, uh, and agitating against the passivity of performance uh, and the lack of spontaneity. Uh, but he was also an early psychiatrist and psychologist. So he started exploring the use of spontaneity in therapy. And this is what Moreno is most known for today. It's psychodrama, uh, where he um, staged role-playing events. And role-playing was Moreno's umbrella term for all his activities. So uh, psychodrama and the theater of spontaneity, uh, and also social drama, which was where you worked with groups. Uh, in psychodrama, um, you would often have a group of people, but you would work with one person at a time. The person might recount some memory, uh, some event, recent or long past, that was uh, troublesome for, for them, that they were still dealing with. And Marina might ask them to uh, reenact it. Go on, come here in the center of the circle and show us uh, how did you behave. And then he might grab someone else from the group and say, OK, so you have the quarrel with your father. Uh, OK, you can you, be, can you be the father? OK, tell us, what should the father do? And then the uh, uh, drama might go on, and then Marina might take the original guy out of the circle and introduce someone else. Okay, now let's do the same thing from the beginning, but now you pretend to be him. Quarrel with the father, and suddenly he's seeing the whole thing from the outside. Psychodrama has a lot of techniques like this, uh, which have to do with role switching. People change roles, being in the center, being in the periphery, uh, and uh, changing between different characters. And the whole purpose was therapeutic. There is still an active psychodrama community in the world. You can go many places and attend a psychodrama session or find a psychodrama therapist. Uh, but I think in recent years it's kind of drifted to the outskirts of mainstream psychology. That is, the people who practice psychodrama are not necessarily educated at universities or licensed as uh, psychotherapists. It has its kind of own community and thing going. Social drama, which I find the most interesting of Moreno's inventions, um, and also the least known, uh, is uh, very much about working with groups the way he would work with individuals in the psychodrama. So you could have a group at an office, and you could sit them down and say, OK, show us uh, one of your meetings. And then the boss begins managing and gives them orders and updates. And Moreno says, OK, out. You're not the boss now. You just observe. Now you, you are now the boss. And then you begin seeing, okay, what's the dynamic here? What's going on between the employees and the boss? Uh, is there something for the boss to learn about leadership here? Is there something for the employees to learn about the issues in their company meetings? See, Marino, uh, being originally a Romanian Jew, uh, living in Vienna in the 1920s and 30s, for understandable reasons, decided to leave the country. He moved to America, uh, and in the U.S. Uh, was the U.S. was where a lot of his work was popularized. Like the techniques were pioneered in Vienna, but psychodrama really became a, a big big thing when Marina moved to the U.S. Uh, and so, for a while, role playing started entering mainstream culture. The idea of role playing um, you would find newspaper articles referring to role playing, often with an explanation, but it was still there. Which leads us to the next fascinating chapter in the history of role-playing. Because now we are in the 1950s. 
the Cold War is, um, is going on at full strength. Uh, the American government is uh, obsessed with preparing for a Soviet nuclear attack, discussing whether they themselves should initiate the nuclear war as to have a better chance of winning it. Um, and to supplement the world of their military hierarchy, the generals and officers and so on, they start employing civilian scientists uh, to research questions of interest for national security. And one of those guys was Hermann Kahn, and he worked at a place called the Rand Corporation, uh, which is still around, uh, staffed by civilians, uh, but researching issues of military interest. And most of the issues they researched had to do with uh, nuclear war. Kahn is known as one of the early futurists, like researchers of the future. And he wrote a book that made him tremendously controversial called On Thermonuclear Warfare, where he argued that nuclear war should be won and maybe it wasn't a bad idea to start one. That was at least the popular presentation of his views. To do him some justice, he also had very good friends in the peace movement and was not necessarily the warmonger he was made out to be. Khan and others at the Rand Corporation struggled with the question of simulating a nuclear war. They had early computers, they had uh, impressive mathematics, they had the engineering skills uh, and the physics skills to begin predicting the outfall of a nuclear attack. What they couldn't account for was the human factor, decision making. How are the Soviets going to react if we do this? How will we realistically react if the Soviets do that? And to explore that, these people started um, exploring the idea of role playing, which had entered culture somehow through Marino. This is from one of their strategic role-playing simulation games. Um, not sure exactly when the picture uh, was taken, but at uh, some point in the 1950s. In a typical game like this, you would have uh, one room uh, being the American leadership, and they would often be recruited from the American military and the American civilian leadership. You might have another room who would then pretend to be the Soviet leadership. And then you might have a third room where the games masters sit and determine the outcome of, of the events that are going on in the other rooms. And they also doubled in strategy gaming, trying to explore on these maps um, ways to visualize the outcome of nuclear wars. The Rand Corporation scientists held, I think, two or three of these. And then they dropped the entire day of role playing because it was too fuzzy. Uh, they couldn't give very good predictions of uh, future outcomes based on the role-playing alone. So they returned to their computers and their number crunching. However, some of the people they invited to attend these um, simulations, uh, they were political scientists, uh, amongst others from Stanford University, uh, who would then go in, you would have an expert on Soviet uh, politics to play a Soviet politician. And they found these games deeply and overwhelmingly uh, inspiring and felt that there was a lot of insight to be gained from these games, even if there wasn't that much fact to be produced. So some of these political scientists returned to their home universities and started doing role-playing sessions with graduate students. Eventually they did so with the master students, bachelor students, and we come to perhaps the first wave of educational role-playing. Uh, how many here have been to Model United Nations or know what it is? Yeah, it's still around, it's still a big thing. It's being run in schools pretty much all over the world where um, uh, people in a class are divided into, okay, you're supposed to be this country and that country and then you sit down and you have a session of the United Nations. And this comes from that period when the idea of role playing uh, begins entering the ed educational establishment. And then there's another, uh, on the other side of culture here, outside of the military and outside of politics and outside of universities, there are some new subcultures. Sixties, of course, is known for its big countercultures, uh, hippies, anti-war movement, and so on. But there was also a growing hobby of strategy game enthusiasts. Um, and they're relevant. Uh, I'll show you why in a moment. And Lord of the Rings, Tolkien's work had been published. It had been published in uh, 1954, the first issue, but it was in the 60s that it really began selling well. Uh, and in the hippie movement, for example, Lord of the Rings became like, uh, or not a Bible, but the book everybody had read. So Lord of the Rings was a really big thing, and Lord of the Rings fans started for looking, looking for ways to make this stuff more lively. Uh, 
And now you've read the books, you've read the appendices. Uh, the Silmarillion isn't out yet. You've read The Hobbit 15 times. Now what? Well, you know, let's dress up in costume and try to relive the atmosphere of the books. This is a more modern photo, uh, but you start seeing the first of these Tolkien reenactment and stuff like that in the late 60s, I believe. And then from this world of people interested in strategy games and people interested in speculative fiction, uh, you get this, Dungeons and Dragons, the first role-playing game. And I think most histories of LARP will begin here, not with all the stuff I went through so far. Uh, because Dungeons & Dragons has been hugely influential. I don't know the sales numbers, but at some point in the 80s, 80% 80 of American uh, kids below a certain age had played Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, and it begins here in 1973. Um, and uh, you'll notice there's one word that is not on this cover. Rules for fantastic medieval war games, campaigns, playable with paper and pencil and miniature figures. No role-playing. Dungeons and Dragons came out of this crowd, the strategy game enthusiasts, uh, who started mixing in some inspiration from fantasy fiction uh, in with some of the rule sets that worked with in strategy games. Um, and the name role-playing game was coined later. Uh, and it was coined not by the people who designed this game, because if you still, if you read the early editions of Dungeons and Dragons, you will not find much mention of actually playing roles. Uh, you, you will have a character, yes but uh, there is no implication that you will speak with the voice of the character uh, or pretend to be the character. It was coined later to describe the activity, uh, to describe what the players of Dungeons and Dragons did when they played it, especially when you started having imitation games, like games like Dungeons and Dragons, but not exactly the same. Uh, and that's where the term comes from, the role-playing game. As I mentioned, role-playing games were for a while, very, very big, and especially Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, I think this is a good sampling from the year 1982, where two movies came out. E.T., which was one of the early really mega blockbusters. It was a film that every kid had seen twice, and everybody's mother had a relationship to. Is this like a, health, a wholesome movie to watch? And these here are like four young all-American boys. They are the, some of the main characters of the movie. And because they do all-American boy things like riding bicycles and playing football and so on, there's also a short session where they play Dungeons and Dragons. The same year also saw another movie starring Tom Hanks called Mazes and Monsters. Mazes and Monsters features a group of, uh, of role players who are playing a game called Mazes and Monsters. <laughs> no resemblance to Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> and uh, in the movie, uh, Tom Hanks up to the right there, he, he goes crazy from playing role playing games. Uh, and that's kind of the main plot of the movie. Uh, and the tipping point, the point where Tom Hanks goes mad is the moment that this group of perfectly ordinary young students uh, decide to try to do this role-playing stuff live. <laughs> <laughs> so they go into the sewage tunnels, or uh, there are some old caves close to the university, and they try to enact scenes from the role-playing game in there. And this was a thing at the time. There was um, media hysteria, moral panic. Um, parents were worried that role-playing would lead to suicide and so on. Pretty much all of that has been discredited, but it was since role-playing was a new thing, or role-playing games were a new thing um, in mainstream culture, uh, a lot of questions were asked, and this movie capitalized a lot on a lot of those fears. And of course, uh, the idea of doing role-playing live was not unique to <coughs> Tom Hanks and his friends in the movie. I think the first recorded LARP, at least where we have a very clear chain of continuity, was uh, Treasure Trap done at a place called Peckforton Castle, and they're still in business. Still, you can still go to, uh, to Britain and attend a Treasure Trapped LARP. Uh, in the UK, in England, I think. Um, and um, all right, um, They started out very much with the idea of doing Dungeons & Dragons live, and uh, a lot of the people have started doing role-playing in the years later, uh, in, the, in the 80s especially. Um, 
had this idea of, okay, this Dungeons and Dragons thing, like sitting around a table and pretending to be people moving through uh, mazes and killing things and grabbing their loot. Um, this is all very good and fun, but it would be more fun if we did it live. Uh, if we did it with our whole bodies. And maybe we could wear some costume also. Um, and that's pretty much the early days of LARP, like the term LARP. It's also called LRP, uh, or simply live role playing. So from these early LARPs, this like, let's do Dungeons and Dragons live, um, there are now, if you remember the map I showed earlier, there are quite a lot of LARP cultures around. And if you look at my hair, for example, and my style, uh, I still have the hairstyle of a male 90s LARPer. Like uh, people at my school, uh, my high school would recognize, yeah, he looks like one of those LARPer guys. The thing with like unruly long hair is that it's very easy to let it loose for if you're going to play a Viking LARP and you can cut it if you're going to play a 20s LARP and so on. Uh, but it was uh, a subculture, still is a subculture in many places. Outside of the regular establishment, outside of the schools, outside of the scout clubs, outside of the universities, uh, no adult supervision. Uh, young people who gather in forests or uh, cafes uh, to role play. And LARP in the 90s, at least in Scandinavia, was again met with new waves of suspicion uh, and moral panic. Uh, and I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that, well, we were young people without adult supervision, but also we were doing something that the rest of society couldn't determine the purpose of. We were going around in the forest playing, not to become better sword fighters, because who needs to become a, a good sword fight, fighter these days? Not to show off our uh, acting skills, uh, but simply because we enjoyed it. And this still makes uh, LARP an odd fellow out. I've tried to assemble this here timeline. So if you remember, we started out in 1910 in Augarten. And uh, if we are going to disbelieve Moreno, we might need to start out in 1917 or something instead because it's not, the only source we have for his earliest stuff is Moreno himself. With psychodrama, social drama, role playing, uh, the scouts movements were doing similar-ish stuff at the time. Uh, 1950s, we began having these role playing simulation war games and the first wave of educational LARPs. 1973 and onwards, we get role playing games like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, 1990s, we find fantasy LARP cultures uh, based on Tolkien or inspired by Tolkien's work spreading all over the place. And now we come to the interesting era. Uh, as mentioned, I update this map once every year. Um, so if you know anything that's wrong, if you know of a country here that has LARP, uh, an active LARP community, please let me know. Um, I just included uh, Vietnam. And this is the last year I will use this map. Because there uh, it has traditionally been kind of a division in the world of LARP. I mean, most of these LARP communities have been local. They haven't communicated much with people in other cities or other countries. The internet, of course, changed that. Uh, so LARP has developed very differently in very, very different places. And for a while, it seemed like the big divide went between the blue and the green countries there. Where the blue countries, 90% uh, of what they call LARP uh, has quite a lot of rules. Like you have to memorize several pages of rules in order to be able to play. You might have a judge who determines uh, whether uh, you have succeeded or failed, um, stuff like that. Uh, it's genre, fantasy uh, predominantly. Uh, combat or action adrenaline is a big part of the appeal. And then the green countries are, well, maybe these traditions exist there as well, but there are also, there's more diversity. There are contemporary events, there are um, other kinds of LARP. But the thing is that every time I show these blue countries, somebody comes and tells me, you know, that's not really true any longer. Like there's a lot more happening in American LARP these days. Um, so this is inaccurate. Um, well, yes, this is technically true for what is called LARP in the UK, but if you take into account what they call freeform in the UK, then the UK should also maybe be green and so on. So I'm putting big question marks over all the blue countries and declaring a victory for the movement for diversifying LARP. <laughs> <laughs> and moving along. Today, uh, as far as I can tell, there are four big LARP traditions uh, that exert influence outside of their homeland. Uh, 
that is the Russian LARP tradition, which started in 1990, although some claim to find roots back to the 1920s or even 1910s, but officially started in 1990 uh, with something called Hobbit Games. Uh, the Russian LARP community is, uh, is actually the Russian language LARP community. It's quite large, uh, probably in the tens of thousands, um, and you find uh, examples of, of Russian LARP almost anywhere where the Russian language is spoken, including, for example, in Israel, where a number of recent immigrants uh, speak Russian and have had uh, their own LARP community. Uh, then there is Nordic LARP, um, a complicated term, but that's where a lot of us who are teaching and facilitating uh, this year, we come from this tradition of Nordic LARP. The Nordic countries are uh, Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, and the autonomous territories of Greenland and the Faroe, Orland and the Faroe Islands. <laughs> Um, uh, and then uh, American LARP, um, as I said, diversifying, but has also had influence outside of the borders of the US. That is, you will find people in other countries who have learned LARPing uh, from the US. Uh, and UK LARP, as I mentioned, the stuff called LARP in the UK tends to be fairly similar, rule savvy, genre, uh, and so on. Uh, but it's also been picked up in other countries. Like, for example, Australian LARP has been influenced by UK LARP. And then there are some other big communities. Can you explain monolithic? Yeah, uh, a monolith is like a big, tall, singular thing. Uh, monolithic is having the properties of a big, tall, singular thing, as opposed to a lot of small, different things. Was that uh, understandable? Yeah. More black and white than color. Hmm. And then you find a very large uh, LARP community in Germany. You find a large and growing LARP community in France, and you find major communities in uh, many other European countries. I mean, this, this here map is a bit optimistic, because these, some of these countries, there is only one LARP per year, roughly. I think that's the case with Malaysia, for example. There are LARPs there with some frequency, but it's not very big. And then we come to inter-Nordic LARP. <laughs> there is a long discussion about the definition of Nordic LARP. <laughs> uh, the expert on the question, Mr. Dr. Jakob Stenros, is sitting here on the front row. Um, also, sometimes called progressive, sometimes art house. I like art house because it sounds weird. I like weird. <laughs> sometimes just called Nordic, sometimes called NORP, um, coined by Oliver, who is also here. Uh, or uh, even prognorp. <laughs> and there's a discussion about whether this is simply a tradition of people talking together about LARP or a distinct style of LARPing. Uh, in the Nordic countries, uh, we come from a strong fantasy background, um, but in most of the Nordic countries, the kind of LARP that evolved was different than the kind of LARP they invented when trying to make Dungeons and Dragons live in the UK and US. We used fewer rules. It was, uh, for some reason, uh, not so important to have large rule books and make sure that things were fair all the time. Uh, many of us started looking into our own histories for inspiration rather than the world of Tolkien uh, or the world of fantasy role-playing games. Um, if you go into the early 90s, uh, you also begin finding like historical LARPs based on Viking societies, for example. Uh, if you go into the late 90s, you'll begin finding other historical epochs being simulated. Uh, 1942, which I think is one of the most impressive LARPs I've ever been to, uh, where they converted a whole village into, um, turned back the clock 50 years uh, to the occupation during World War II. Uh, these are photos taken in-game, in character. So the photographer was role-playing a photographer, taking a family portrait. And when it comes, and uh, yes, uh, talking about um, the strategy simulation games, role-playing simulation games, this is also a historical game set in the 1980s, or parallel history, because in this version of history there was an American president and a Soviet leader who almost came to the brink of nuclear war. Um, and they were not um, historical people, but it was based on the historical context. Uh, so this is the Soviet Politburo in session. Uh, LARP set in the present day, uh, this is an advertising agency. Uh, this is a social realist LARP that happens, it's written about Romanian immigrants in Italy 
by a Romanian immigrant in Italy, about a family of Romanian Im immigrants in Italy who are having an Easter celebration. Although this picture here is from the Norwegian run. We were not that good at maybe playing Italians or Romanians, but we still gave it a fair try. Uh, this is uh, absurd LARP, um, or uh, I'm, I'm not sure there is a genre for this LARP. Um, there is a meeting of the culture, a party of the cultural elite, and during the evening, uh, people's clothes lose their colors, uh, and everybody becomes very emotionless, and they begin talking about what, how great it is to live in Norway. Uh, LARPs about relationships, love in the age of debasement, uh, six couples at the cafe on the verge of breakup. Uh, musical LARPs. So there is a lot of diversity in the inter-Nordic community. And there's been a lot of discussions for the last 15, 20 years about, okay, so what is LARP and what can we do with it and how does it work and how does it relate to other things like theatre or performance or games or, um, or uh, therapy and so on. And part of the reason there is this strong inter-Nordic movement is this event, Solmukokta, as it's called in Finland, uh, Knutepunkt, which is, it's called in Norway, and uh, Danish and Swedish are then Knutepunkt and Knutepunkt. Uh, so it's the same name just translated to the four different languages. And it rotates, it's a conference or festival and rotates every year uh, between each of these four countries. And it's been going on since 1997. For each Knutepunkt for the last uh, few years there's been a book published. This is my bookshelf, it's already full. I've started using the window sills for the newer books. <laughs> Uh, containing um, some very clear and articulate uh, and uh, easily understandable articles on uh, LARP design and role-playing, some very hard to understand articles. Uh, if you read through all the Knut books, which I did a couple of years ago, you find, uh, you find the voice of a community struggling to find a common terminology and a common understanding of what they're doing and its potential. And in a way, Knutepunkt is the bridge to the summer school because uh, quite a lot of us who are here uh, as teachers or facilitators, uh, we first met each other at the Knutepunkt festival and then maybe went to a LARP together and so on. Now, we are not the only people experimenting with role playing these days. There are some others. Uh, there's something called indie RPGs, this is an American movement, also based, comes from the continuity from Dungeons and Dragons and on, onwards. Um, I'll skip quite quickly through these because I have five minutes left. There's something called Freeform, which is now in the, almost indistinguishable from Nordic LARP. Family Andersen, I think, is technically a Freeform. Uh, traditionally, we used LARP about the bigger things where you wore costumes and prepared for a while in advance and free form for something where you didn't need costume and you could play it in a classroom. But we keep blurring the boundaries. One example of the blurring of boundaries is this game, which you'll hear about later, the Bader Meinhof experiment. This was originally played realist. This is with costumes as good as we could find. We are in the 1970s. We are at a radical collective in Oslo. They are being visited by an acquaintance from Germany who turns out to be on a mission to bomb an embassy and tries to recruit them. The police are sitting in the apartment next door and listening in on the whole thing. Uh, and again, this was done as realistically as we could. These were actual apartments that were next door and so on. Uh, and eventually the police always intervene. And this is the exact same game, except it's played in a black box stage in Stockholm. Now uh, the walls and floors and so on are not real um, apartments. Uh, the police are sitting over there to the left and they're listening in. They don't need surveillance equipment because there is actually no wall there. There's just a line on the floor and we pretend it's a wall. Uh, and so over here we were very clearly at what we traditionally understood as being a LARP. And here we're some, somewhere in the terrain of what we maybe understood to be freeform. And the term for this, which you'll also come to know a lot better during the week, is black box, uh, black box LARPing. And another game you will come to meet, the When Our Destinies Meet. You can see a phone conversation being carried out by hands. In the traditional Norwegian LARP, at least, we would not do phone calls that way. We would need a telephone. And then we come to EduLARP, because the ostensible purpose of this uh, school is to teach educational role-playing design. Uh, Österskola after school is kind of the example we always hype uh, when talking about uh, edu LARP and LARP. Uh, 
uh, to strangers. It's a boarding school in Denmark. It was the first, now there are two. They teach the regular school curriculum for one year. And they teach every aspect of the curriculum using role playing. Uh, sometimes role playing in a very loose definition, bordering on, on gaming and so on, but still that's the mission. Uh, they are not the only people who are exploring educational role playing based on a history of Nordic LARP. Uh, there are companies and institutions uh, practicing educational role playing in uh, Denmark, uh, outside of Estoskov, uh, in Sweden, uh, in Norway, and it's a growing wave. An educational role play is not necessarily for children at schools. It may as well be uh, for adults at job training. Uh, it might be uh, for NGOs and organizations preparing themselves for various scenarios. And that's pretty much the bridge up until today. And I'm exactly on time, I can see. Uh, I'm just ending with these questions, which I feel that we are still exploring and will be exploring this air week. Marino's original questions, what happens when we structure play and what happens when we invite adults to play? Thank you.